We've been brainwashed ever since Henry Ford started his assembly line in 1913. Within a year, his company was making a new car every 93 minutes. As production rose, the price fell. In 1908, the first Model T sold for $825, more than half of a very good annual salary. In 1916, the car sold for $345, and 700,000 were produced. In the Model T's last year, 1927, Ford sold 15 million. The price tag, $290. The car had taken over our minds and our nation. Politicians and planners started rebuilding the American identity. Oil was turned into gasoline. Land was turned into roads. The federal government began funding the construction of our highways. We gave up thinking for paving. After all, our national birthright was unrestricted travel, and the car promised that freedom. Why, we could even live or work in our vehicles, not to mention eat, no matter what time of day. Rush hour and gridlock soon entered our vocabulary, and that promise of freedom began evaporating. In the last decade, more than 100,000 cars swelled the ranks of those vehicles already committed to Massachusetts traffic. On any given day, most of them seem to be on Boston Central Artery. In the last half of the 20th century, we've become slaves to cars and highways. As costs for both keep escalating, so do the problems of pollution, congestion, parking, and stress. Yet we keep funding the construction of our neurosis. The planners of the Central Artery Third Harbor Tunnel Project are trying to turn our thinking to mass transit. But this is still first and foremost a car lover's production. I'm Arnie Reisman, and if you ask me, if we keep shrinking our landscape and lifestyle with paved roads and parking lots, we're soon going to have to invest in some pretty clever ideas if we ever hope to keep our civilization and our sanity on track. It's a project that's critically important, we think, for the future of Massachusetts. And when it's done, uh, we believe that not only will the air quality in the city be better, but the city will be more beautiful and the transportation, both in terms of our ability to commute to and from work and the ability to get goods and products and services uh, through the city will be significantly improved. So said Massachusetts Lieutenant Governor Paul Salucci. Those are high-toned promises you would expect from one of the officials in charge of the largest public works project in the United States today. But before we explore just how we're going to improve transportation while we improve our air quality, we should check the project's progress. Is the big dig itself on track? Let's hear from two people not in charge of it, two former state transportation secretaries, one Republican, one Democrat. Progress is being made year by year. I even think that the project is being competently managed for the most part. But these mega projects, have glitches. If you look at them anywhere in the world, the Channel Tunnel, the Denver Airport, uh, the, uh, the Tokyo Airport that was built a few years ago, and the Osaka, we tend to think the Japanese can do these things without difficulty. There are always unforeseen glitches, and we have seen them in this project. It's a project of ex unbelievable complexity. We're not doing the project as some sort of abstract underground sculpture. We're doing this because our transportation system desperately needs it, and the existing elevated central artery is literally falling apart, and it's, our economy demands that that be replaced as soon as possible. I think they're doing a good job in, uh, in keeping the first phase of the tunnel essentially on time. Uh, they're still talking about early opening next fall. That's only a slippage of a few months on a project of this size. That's totally understandable. So not bad for a political report card. And you have to admit the construction of the Third Harbor Tunnel really moved along swiftly and quietly. It will be completed and ready for traffic by the end of 1995. Commercial traffic, that is. Trucks, buses, and cabs. Where we are right now is in the South Boston Tunnel approach. And we're about 80 or 100 feet below ground, someplace that used to be on uh, sea level, as it were, with uh, a bunch of fish manufacturing facilities here in South Boston. Peter Zook is the executive director of the Central Artery Third Harbor Tunnel Project. This is a cut and cover tunnel, meaning we're opening up a hole and we're going to cover it over again, which is going to connect to the immersed tube tunnel to make it possible to come across Route 93, through South Boston, under Boston Harbor, 
onto Logan Airport property. So we're in that tunnel, the Ted Williams tunnel. A home run for all the people in New England, and it's a grand slam home run for you, brother. In September 1994, the old splendid splinter of the Red Sox got to ride through his namesake before it was even completed. The privilege came with a special chauffeur, Governor William Weld. By the time the tunnel officially opens, the bill will come to something close to $1.3 billion, a sizable fraction of an overall project budget that's approaching $8 billion and may go higher. But what you get for your money are four more lanes taking traffic in and out of Logan Airport, plus 1,400,000 tiles, all hand-placed, and 27,000 ceiling panels, also affixed by human beings, but with much help from expensive machinery. Meanwhile, outside the Ted Williams Tunnel, it's going to take about another five years to complete the seaport access road that will link the tunnel to the Massachusetts Turnpike. That's why non-commercial vehicles like yours and mine will not be allowed passage here until the end of the century. So in the interim period of time, we're using temporary roadways like the Hall Road in South Boston so that we can keep traffic out of those communities. And you could not handle the volume of traffic you'd have to handle and let it run through the tunnel without all that traffic spilling over into the South Boston community and into the East Boston community if the interchange is incomplete. The Hall Road, designed to take trucks off South Boston's narrow streets, is a two-lane, one-mile stretch extending from Dorchester Avenue to Congress Street. One of the first elements of this project to be finished, this road will be the primary conveyor of traffic into the tunnel system for the time being. When the South Boston Bypass finally links the Hall Road to the Southeast Expressway, also known as I-93, commercial drivers will have a real expressway connecting the waterfront to the airport to the interstate. The major element holding up construction of the Seaport Access Road and keeping the rest of us out of the tunnel is the Fort Point Channel Dilemma. Critics accuse Bechtel and Parsons Brinkerhoff the engineering firms that are partners with the state on the big dig, of inflating the delay and the dollars. The plan was to create a cut and cover through the channel's inconsistent soil in front of the Gillette parking lot for about $40 million. Then Bechtel had second thoughts and decided that the plan literally wouldn't hold water. They speculated that to really get through the channel would take another two years and cost more than 10 times as much. The state didn't like this change. The Bechtel Parsons team, it should be noted, was going to make a lot of money no matter what the plan. Don Hammer is the division so point man overseeing the big dig for the Federal state. Highway Administration. And the reason Bechtel is here is because the state really didn't have uh, the capability to, to mount that kind of a, a large um, workforce in, in the short amount of time needed to get the project up and running. Bechtel had access to, to all of the specialists that were needed. Uh, they brought a lot of experience and confidence with them to, uh, to the project. Because of their experience, Bechtel also assumed the role of management consultant, technically making them the overseer of their own work. This has made a few critics wince when assessing the contractual arrangement here. The other matter is, of course, it's a cost plus contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, although nobody intended it this way in the state, one consequence of this is that uh, with every year of delay, another hundred million dollars or so goes to the Bechtel Parsons team. It's very difficult when you're doing a handcrafted job that nobody has ever done before that, uh, and you don't know what exactly what it ought to cost at the beginning. To structure a contract so there are penalty clauses if it doesn't get built by a certain time in a certain budget, nobody would take the contract under those circumstances. But at the same time, you have to monitor awfully closely when you've got a cost plus contract that in the end is going to be somewhere between a billion and two billion dollars in total. What was written about back in the, uh, in the summertime was a, uh, a potentially $500 million uh, cost overrun if we were to go about the construction as it was originally planned. Obviously, we're not going to do that. We've known for quite some time that we weren't going to do that. Kerasi Otis and his colleagues have opted to tunnel through Fort Point Channel in much the same way they tunneled through Boston Harbor, using immersed tubes, except this time they'll be concrete. So essentially, we'll be pushing the tunnel through the soft soil instead of cutting, holding the walls back, dropping it in. We're just going to push it through, and we're going to save hundreds of millions of dollars by doing it. When there are questions about whether our management consultant, our designers, our contractors have done anything which has a cost consequence to the state, that we're going to refer that to a body of public employees who are going to make a judgment about whether we should be seeking to recover excess costs against any of those parties. While criticism of cost containment and accountability continues in some quarters, artery officials have shown their mettle when it comes to the price of dirt. 
Twice they have rejected bids nearing $200 million to remove the natural byproduct of the dig. In the meantime, about a fourth of all that's being excavated is still making its way to Spectacle Island. The plan still stands that over the next three years, about 2.7 million cubic yards of dirt will be plowed into that former dumping ground in Boston Harbor. After that, Spectacle Island will be reshaped into a wildlife preserve and recreational park where people can hike, picnic, observe nature, play sports in designated fields, and sail right into a brand new marina. Meanwhile, back on the mainland, they continue to dig up new dirt under the central artery to relocate utilities away from the path of the designated depressed version of that rusting roadway. At Dock Square, on the edge of the Quincy Market area, Curtis Davis, the State Highway Department's Project Director of Design and Engineering, explained how they keep the city from falling over while they're digging under it. There are a number of things that you have to look out for when you make a major excavation next to uh, an existing building, particularly a historic building. Um, when you dig that large hole, there are a couple of things that go on. One is um, related to the forces of earth. Um, when you take that earth out, the earth next to it tends to want to fall into that hole, as anybody who's ever dug a hole knows. And as that earth moves, it might take the foundations of an existing building or cause a wall um, next to that um, uh, excavation to move a little bit. There are a number of instruments that we use to uh, determine whether or not we're in trouble. Uh, one of the instruments is called an inclinometer. That measures the movement of a wall from a fixed position. And that movement of the wall can be either braced so that the actual wall doesn't move, or the excavation can be shored up so that the excavation supports aren't moving. The other thing you want to be concerned about is the water table, the water that runs below the surface of the earth. As you dig um, a deep excavation that goes below the water table on a temporary basis or a permanent basis, you may be bringing the water table level down. Older buildings were uh, supported on piles. These are wooden poles that go down to the uh, bedrock. And those uh, poles don't rot when they're surrounded in water. If it's a permanent drawdown of the water table, that will expose your pile and your pile caps. And that's probably the worst thing you can do for a foundation on an old building because when those piles are exposed to the air, they tend to want to rot. Once they begin to rot, you begin to lose your foundation and the building can collapse. Davis is not auditioning for the role of Chicken Little here. His alarm rings true, as some property owners in Back Bay have discovered over the years. Caution comes with the territory when you're digging in landfill. This is the utility relocation area across from Dock Square under the ramp that feeds into the Callahan Tunnel. They dig down 120 feet and create a support structure so they can work underground without sinking Boston. This requires slurry, a mixture of water and polymer and bentonite, a clay made from volcanic ash that can absorb great quantities of water and expand to several times its volume. When it does this, it holds open the excavation. A machine called a hydromill actually does the digging, pumps out the dirt with the slurry, separates them, and sends the slurry back down the hole. Steel panels are lowered into these holes to help support the weight of the artery during the removal of the ground beneath the surface road. While they're below the street, the panels are reinforced with concrete. They become slurry walls. This is the same process that will be used when they finally go under the surface road here to depress the artery into an eight to 10 lane tunnel connecting north and south stations. Like the rest of the project, this job will be funded up to 85% by the federal government. So far, no checks have bounced. But with the lowering of each panel of support, some people are wondering if that other kind of support will soon be lowered. What's going to happen now that members of our congressional delegation no longer have any clout? Gone are the committee's seats of power for Ted Kennedy, Joe Kennedy, Kerry, Markey, Moakley, Studs, and Frank. Now in the driver's seat, Jesse Helms and his fellow critics of Massachusetts may greatly depress the central artery. They may depress it right out of the next federal budget. The funding in large part is coming from a federal bill that could terminate in 1997. Former State Transportation Secretary Altshuler is betting Massachusetts will still be on a roll by then. After all, he says, the artery is an interstate. It's I-93. In the legislation that was passed in 1991, a six-year bill, uh, there was a provision for the completion of interstate segments, interstate highway segments, that hadn't been completed over the 35 years till then of the interstate program, which is now coming to an end. As we get up to 1997, we will be almost the only state that still needs money of this type. 
before completion of the interstate system. We will have a powerful argument on our side, and that is that the federal government has always treated interstate projects historically as projects that it would fund to completion. And that if the state can establish that it has done its work well, efficiently, and in accord with federal environmental laws and so on, uh, then the principle of completion, federal funding to completion, is powerful. The largest construction contract ever let in the history of Massachusetts will be um, uh, getting into construction this spring. It's uh, roughly a $400 million piece of construction that begins mainline construction for the artery. So for all of the naysayers around that says, ah, there'll be a harbor tunnel, but there's never going to be an artery suppressed, you don't think that's true? Just look behind you. <laughs> Good shot, Mr. Secretary, but not quite. That's the right equipment on Fulton Street, but when we were talking, it was used to relocate gas and phone lines. But let's say your optimism pays off. Who's going to be in charge of this underground roadway? Who's going to be in charge of the Ted Williams Tunnel, for that matter? The um, Third Harbor Tunnel is the completion of I-90, and I-90 is the turnpike. Uh, the turnpike has the, uh, the two tunnels, which are uh, behind my shoulder here. They operate those. So they're going to operate the two tunnels in the north, the one tunnel in the south, and uh, there's a link between the two, and the only thing missing is that central artery. It seems to us that, that they are the most logical operator for two reasons. Number one is they're in the business, and number two is that they have a, um, a substantial amount of wealth and, and strength in their balance sheet that they can help to pay for a considerable part of the project, and we think that makes sense. It's good public policy. That's a turnaround. Last year, Karasiotis went on record saying the Turnpike Authority had little reason to stay in existence common sense uh, would dictate that we should be the agency. I think our chief concern is that the call be made soon uh, by the legislature as to our operating the system because there's a great deal of preparation and uh, research and, and a host of things we would have to do to prepare ourselves to operate uh, the tunnel, for instance, which uh, I believe is going to be open, uh, at least the plan is to open it in about a year. They may eventually need a toll on the Charles River crossing just to pay for all the delays. After dozens of designs were challenged, one was finally approved with the blessing of the federal government in the summer of 1994. At last, we have a concept for linking the new artery to routes 1 and 93 beyond North Station. The reactions to Scheme Z, the original plan, held up the project for three years. This new design features a cable-stayed bridge that carries 10 lanes of traffic over the river. A second bridge, Running at the same elevation carries four lanes between Starrow Drive and Route 1. The new plan calls for replacing the existing temporary loop ramps with two and a half new loop ramps, 40 feet above the ground, and parkland on both sides of the river. This will cost an additional $1.3 billion to pay for the crossing and the delays, the same amount we paid for the Ted Williams Tunnel. Construction is slated for 1996. According to Karasiotis, the delays from mitigation and mediation with environmental and residential groups are responsible for the budget increase, not mismanagement. On the Charlestown side of the river, things are beginning to look brighter in one respect, but a little darker in another. With the twist of a wrench in September 1994, the Transportation Secretary ceremoniously initiated the removal of the elevated roadway over City Square in Charlestown. The superstructure had blocked out much of the sun for nearly 40 years, back when the Tobin was called the Mystic River Bridge. Now, the neighborhood will be open to several acres of its own new parkland and a clear view of its harbor. The dismantling here was made possible by the grand opening of a set of ramps connecting two new city square tunnels with the upper and lower decks of Route 93. These ramps replace that dangerous 600-foot traffic weave between Starrow Drive and the Tobin Bridge. Now there's a 2,000-foot stretch instead. This hasn't really done much to unsnarl the traffic. In essence, they've taken a death-defying merge and replaced it with a sleep-inducing one. But don't forget, this too is temporary. These ramps and tunnels were rushed into service to mitigate tempers in Charlestown. They will be changed once again when the Charles River crossing is built. Steve Taco's Massport runs the Tobin. It doesn't appear at this point in time to have made a huge difference. It's safer, but you still have the same, you know, volume of traffic is increasing on the bridge. Uh, it's, I think, 9 or 10 percent this year, uh, and probably more next year. The whole system has got to be in place for us to really measure its impact on traffic flow. And I do think that people are expecting when there's a minor modification or an early opening of something, that immediately all the problems are going to go away. 
This is not only a mess, it's a plot, a calculated conspiracy on the part of the planners and designers of this project to drive us around the bend, to make us break into a cold sweat every time we see traffic, and ultimately to give up our cars and plead for alternative methods of getting in and out of Boston. Which brings us back to the question of how the state hopes to improve transportation while at the same time improving air quality. They plan to do it with the help of the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, affectionately known as ICE-T. This 1991 federal law, the one Altshuler referred to, offered funds for solving transportation problems beyond simply building more roads. Washington finally found some wisdom and passed a new transportation incentive saying to the states, we're going to give you some money and give you much greater flexibility to allow you to decide how you spend it as long as you spend it on creating a plan for your transportation network, your shipping, your port, your airport, your automobiles, your trains, your subways. Bring them together in a concept that moves people and goods more effectively. That's intermodal thinking and the state went for it and decided to spend more on public transportation to show it wasn't a mistake to give it all that money. Formerly, the state director of environmental affairs, John DeVillers, is the regional administrator for the EPA. We definitely need to expand uh, existing MBTA lines and commuter rail opportunities. That is, in fact, an important condition of this highway project. After much squabbling with state officials over the years, the MBTA has set its sights on some expansion and improvements to be funded by Ice-T. You're in the, uh, what I would describe as the pulse of the MBTA system. You're here on the Red Line platform at South Station. And what you have right above us right now is the South Side Commuter Rail Network, inner city passenger service, and buses. Um, what will change over the next several years is you'll, you'll have, in effect, a red line intermodal sandwich. Right below me, some nine feet below, that close, will be the central artery. Right above me, also about nine feet, will be the new tunnel for the electric trolley bus, the transitway, that'll come in from South Boston. This new transitway is designed to expand the concept of downtown Boston by making the Fort Point Channel area accessible. The new electrified bus route will go from South Station to Fan Pier, where a new federal courthouse and office building will soon be erected, up to the World Trade Center, where a new hotel will soon be erected, and loop back around to South Station. To get this up and running by the year 2000, and to start the eventual tunneling of the central artery, they first have to underpin the red line so it can withstand the construction and not get squished in the intermodal sandwich. Linda Miller, project engineer for Bechtel Parsons, has spent many months poring over this aspect of the project. The underpinning uh, uh, begins uh, right in the middle of, of downtown Boston, right in the middle of one of the busiest intersections. Um, it had, this area sees uh, 40,000 commuters in the morning, 40,000 commuters in the afternoon with the combined um, commuter rail, red line subway, tremendous amount of uh, pedestrian traffic. It's also one of the most beautiful areas of the city. This is a picture you see here of the Dewey Square area. There's South Station. One of the first things we're going to do in the building of the uh, underpinning system is to do, dig two deep shafts made up of three foot thick walls that go down 120 feet deep. These big shafts allow us to get down underneath uh, in order to start building or mining this new underpinning system. Here we are underneath the belly of the Red Line Station, hand mining out small tunnels. Once we get these galleries uh, opened up through there, we're going to drive tubes down from them. And the tubes are filled with holes. And from these tubes, we're going to jet inject grout. It's the same kind of grout that you might use in your bathroom. We're going to inject so much grout into the soil in that area that it's going to form what's called a grout curtain. Uh, and, and that grout curtain will give us an area of soil that's stable, that has a pretty good water cutoff in that area, and an area we'll be able to start mining through these big square tunnels. We'll pump them full of concrete, and they're going to form the walls on either side of the uh, underpinning. They're almost like a bridge abutment. When we have those two bridge abutments in place, again, they're all hand mined, pumped full of concrete through. When we have those in place, we're going to jack square sections underneath the underbelly of the red line from those two, forming then that bed uh, that the red line will rest on throughout the rest of construction. 
Once the supports are in place, they dig down and finish the intermodal sandwich. The transit way on top, the red line in the middle, and the central artery on the bottom. And while we're all driving down there, we'll be right alongside non-electric buses making their way to the new bus terminal, now being constructed at the back of South Station. This $85 million transportation center will be home for all private bus carriers. It will have 225 parking spaces on the second floor. First come, first serve. And from this intermodal facility, the Logan Link will bus passengers to the airport in three minutes down its own private lane in the Ted Williams Tunnel. The Big Dig, with help from Ice-T, is contributing to a $1.2 billion 10-year facelift for that 2,400-acre parcel, Logan Airport. One of the objectives here in the new Logan is going to be uh, how accommodating we can be to our passengers so that they then can look at public transportation as a comfortable, uh, efficient mode into all terminals at the airport without making several changes from, uh, from the T-stop to buses and then to another bus. About 85% of the traffic that will go through the Third Harbor Tunnel is traffic that's headed to the airport. And so when it opens up for full use in the year 2002 or thereabouts, uh, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to produce another challenge for us. In designing the people mover system, what we do is try to understand how we best can move people around the airport. Um, it's going to uh, begin at the uh, at the T station. It's the Disney World type people mover. It'll be raised. Uh, it'll be like a monorail. It will go in and through the lobby of the new hotel that's going to be built in the center of the airport, a new Hilton hotel. It will then link and go all around to each one of the terminals, A, B, C, D, and the new international terminal and it will link by the parking systems and then back out to the T station. We expect that uh, any passenger coming in by public transit accessing the, the monorail system will be able to get to the terminal within six or eight minutes. Wait a minute, did he say the old Hilton would be right in the middle of this new Logan Disneyland? In terms of um, facilities like the Hilton Hotel at the airport, our main interest is in determining whether or not those facilities are really needed for the highway construction. I understand that Massport has some interest in relocating Hilton, and if they do that, that's, of course, their prerogative. But uh, we're not at the point yet where we could say that, that we would participate in relocating Hilton. Massport's repositioning of the Hilton from the fringes to the focus of the airport comes as a shock to the Hyatt, which was just erected in 1993 on those fringes at the other side. When reached for comment, folks at the Hyatt said they hoped to be included in any future roadway construction plans. Anything isolating us, a spokesperson said, would be very disappointing. Now they know how many commuters on the North Shore feel. If you live north of Revere, you can't even get to this nearby airport on public transportation unless you like to kick off your family vacation by dragging your suitcases and kids on a bus. Life would be easier, many say, if the blue line extended beyond Revere. The lines of battle are being drawn right over here. North Shore businessmen and light rail advocates would like to take these tracks and convert them for an electrified rapid transit. The MBTA, on the other hand, has plans to put down a new set of tracks that would carry passengers only as far as Lynn. But wait a minute. If everything's still in the planning stage, what are these tracks doing here already? These rails are major chapters in local history. Originally, these tracks that run near the airport through East Boston were part of the Eastern Railroad, that operated from 1838 throughout the North Shore and up to Newburyport by 1840 until they were taken over by their rival, the Boston and Maine, in 1875. A third line, the Boston, Revere Beach, and Lynn, was a narrow gauge railroad that served communities along the beach between Boston and Lynn. In 1925, this privately owned rail line was electrified. The Edison General Electric Company, today's GE and Lynn, pioneered the electric railway cars that were early renditions of modern light rail cars used in today's public transportation systems. The narrow gauge line gave way to the blue line. Private ownership was replaced by the legislature in 1937 when operations were given to the Metropolitan Transit Commission, forerunner of the MBTA. Three years later, the last electrified train service into Lynn stopped. Points north of Revere have now been without rapid transit for 55 years. Today, the MBTA, which owns the commuter rail, is in negotiation with their opponents who want a light rail, like this one in San Diego, to replace the commuter line to get a faster, more frequent service and have a direct route to the airport. 
What the MBTA is willing to do is fix the existing blue line with funds available from the big dig. The blue line is one, one of our uh, oldest and most reliable lines over the years and has not had a uh, facelift or any significant work in the 40 or so years that it's been in existence. So um, this year, uh, for a 12-month period, we've got um, from Orion Heights out to Wonderland closed down. We're essentially going to rebuild all those stations uh, to bring them up to our, our standards for 1994 stations. You'll see new stations from Orion Heights uh, all the way out in the next several months, and then we'll begin to work towards uh, downtown at Government Center. But will this modernization of the existing Blue Line really get people to abandon their cars and ride the rails? According to the Coastal Corridor, that group of North Shore businessmen and light rail advocates, the answer is no. Tom Leonard, vice president of the Salem Five Cent Savings Bank, is affiliated with this group. The North Shore has always been somewhat behind the rest of the metropolitan Boston area in rapid transit. We have some buses that go around, but it's nowhere near as efficient as we really believe that it, uh, it could be and should be. We would like people to have access to Salem just as easily as they might have access to downtown Boston. And we've joined with a, a local coalition that is looking to extend uh, the blue line out of Revere and all the way into the North Shore. Now, we want that line to come on existing rail track that comes through Lynn and into Salem and then into Beverly and beyond. But what we would like to do is rebuild some of the old abandoned rail lines that would take traffic and take consumers up into the Peabody Danvers area. We could cut our travel time in half between the city of Salem and Government Center, for example, if we had a blue line extension rather than commuter rail. The, the commuter rail right now runs trains probably every 10 or 15 minutes from 8 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock and then at the other end of the day when people are coming back but they run every hour after that. It's very difficult to get into the city of Boston. I, go over to Logan probably a half a dozen times a year where I'm going someplace for the day and returning. I have no need to take my automobile to Logan Airport if I could find a way to get there efficiently. And we could be at Logan Airport in 15 minutes from Salem with the Blue Line expansion. So the Coastal Corridor is fighting with the MBTA about how to use the existing track structure up here. North Shore advocates claim that the conversion to a light rail system as used in other suburban areas would cost $213 million. The MBTA, which would rather not convert, claims its own estimate for a light rail is just too expensive, more than $600 million, and it's not in a spending mood right now. After all, it already built a $40 million commuter rail garage in Lynn that has attracted very few car owners despite its low fee of no charge. The garage was designed, planned, and, and built in anticipation of the blue line being extended to Lynn. Um, that may in fact happen, although if it does, it probably won't happen in the next couple of years. Uh, we're going to continue to look at the configuration of the schedule in an attempt to try to get people into Boston faster, at the same time encourage them to use the Lynn Garage. Opponents, of course, say you could encourage a lot more usage of the garage if you had more rail service. Seeking ICE-T funds, they've brought their case to the U.S. Department of Transportation. If they get them, negotiations with the MBTA may go faster. On the other hand, the argument in favor of keeping the commuter rail on the North Shore is basic. Get rid of it, and you get rid of more Amtrak jobs. You see, the engineers and conductors who work on this railroad are Amtrak employees. They're running the lines for the MBTA. As 1994 closed, some of Amtrak's wheels grinded to a halt. Nearly 20% of its lines were cut, and 5,500 employees let go. The hope is when the smoke clears, there will be a streamlined national train service, funded not only by the federal government, but by the states as well. The conductors and engineers on our commuter route so far survived the cut. We talked to two of them about their jobs, jobs in which they take much pride. Track Charles, uh, dispatches 610. Did you get that uh, request on 832? Restricted on the first, stop on the second. Bob Evans is halfway into his third decade working on the railroad. He's an engineer on the commuter rail, spending most of his hours on the western and southern routes. Well, I started back in 1970 out of Syracuse, New York. My father and my grandfather were both engineers, or my grandfather on my mother's side. So I kind of fell into it naturally. When I, when I graduated from high school, there was an opportunity to work at the, in, out of the, as a hostler 
out of the DeWitt yard. A hostler, a hostler is the begin, usually the beginning stage of an engineer's career. Host, the word hostler comes back from the old stagecoach days of moving teams of horses back and forth. And a hostler in the yard or in, in the railroad moves engines back and forth. And that's where the term hostler comes from. I actually started out as a fireman in freight service. Only now, only in the last, only in the last maybe seven or eight years have engineers started right off as passenger engineers. Years ago, in order to become an engineer, you had to become a fireman first. A fireman comes from the term, comes from the term of shoveling coal into the fire, maintaining a fire. After seven years or so, they sent me to school in New Haven, Connecticut, where I went to school for six months. There, between, the, between classroom work and working with different engineers, going back to Syracuse, New York, and working on the road with freight trains, I, I developed different skills. Then, after that, I had to be tested by different road foremen and different, road, and different classroom tests. After I passed the battery of tests and everything, I received my certificate, my certification, I should call it, to become a, a freight engineer. Excuse me a second. So we're coming into Back Bay now. This is our first stop. What I wanted at that time, I was I was uh, 25, and I or 27, I'm sorry, and I wanted to move move from a freight related service into a passenger service. In Syracuse, New York, it's almost all solid freight, and running freight is entirely different than running passenger trains. So, when I had the opportunity to use exercise my seniority. I came with Conrail at that, that time to work the local commuter rail service out of Boston. And that's what brought me here originally. And I've been here now for almost 17 years. In freight service, you're moving all hours of the day and night, and the trains are two miles long. The, uh, the, the, it's an entirely different skill. It's a much, in, a, in many ways, it's much more difficult running a freight train than it is a passenger train. A passenger train has much more responsibility for obvious reasons of the cargo that we're carrying. Right. Nowadays, because they eliminated the fireman situation and there's usually only an engineer up here, we no longer have a fireman. I'm normally by myself. They get their trainees through their uh, conductors. They take conductors or other people in, re in, related, in the rela related part of the industry send them to school, then they go for six months, they go, uh, they have now they use simulators out in Chicago, they train on simulators, then they come back for on the road training with myself, I'm also a registered instructor, and then they'll get a license. Now all, in, all locomotive engineers are licensed by federal law, and it's, a, it's a very similar, it's very similar to a uh, driver's license. You're, you're, I am obligated by certain laws and regulations of how to conduct myself and, and how to uh, operate a train. Well, I'm one of the few people that can honestly turn around and say that I love the job that I'm doing. I hear so many people in everyday life that I meet complain about their job, medium clear, complain about their job, tell me about how, how miserable life is, about you know when they're at work. I go to work looking forward to it every day. I'm a, I'm a, I have a job that has responsibility, we're crossing okay. over. Over to one. Um, I have a job that with great responsibility and respect, and with a position that I look forward to actually seeing what's gonna happen every day. And every day, something different happens. A lot of people turn around and say, Jeepers, you're on the same route. You, you know, you, um, uh, don't you get bored? Every time I come out here, for the last, for the last 25 years that I've been an engineer, Something is different, not every day. Not one thing is the same thing every day. And as much as I, as well as I run a train, I learn something every day differently about how to run a train. So I'm very fortunate. I consider myself a very lucky man. We're gonna be a couple seconds.
For nearly six years, Jacqueline Britt has been riding the rails as a conductor on the MBTA commuter lines. Someday, she may become an engineer, but as for now, she's totally into conducting. I had the good fortune of meeting an engineer who told me they were hiring for the railroad and subsequently was hired by the railroad. It started with seven weeks training, classroom training, yard training, and then uh, posting on the train with other conductors and assistant conductors. But it's an ongoing, ongoing training. What does what posting mean? Uh, posting is when you don't actually do the job, but you follow a conductor or an assistant conductor around, and he teaches you all the tricks of the trade, uh, reviews everything. The biggest thing is um, watching work habits and developing work habits of your own. So we go through a period of posting, and then we're cut loose, and it's all yours. This is the 205 Needham local, stopping at Back Bay, Ruggles, Forest Hills, Rosendale Village. Bellevue, Highland, West Roxbury, Percy, Needham Junction, Needham Center, and Needham Heights. Next stop will be Back Bay. Jobs aren't just nine to five. You report, you may have a release time where you've got an hour to three hours, maybe longer in between trains, or you may go straight. It's straight time, release time, and overtime, so every job is different. Mayan, for example, is roughly a 12-hour day, but I have four hours and 17 minutes off between certain trains in the morning. This is for WGBH Channel 2, a documentary on the Big Dig and mass transportation, and you're all part of it. Welcome aboard. <laughs> we are actually required to be familiar with the entire south side, and I am a qualified conductor, so therefore I can take a train on any south side line. I'm qualified on all lines south of Boston, and as an assistant conductor, I can work the north side, all lines north of Boston as well. When we pick our jobs, we have different factors that come into play, and one of them is where you live. And I live in Seekonk, Mass., so right now I'm working out of Providence. I report to Providence, and I end up in Providence. Ticket, please. If you own a regular job and you're on that daily, then you cannot help but form a rapport with the regular commuters, and uh, some even on a first-name basis. And some, they miss you when you're not there. And likewise, you, you know when somebody's not there, and the next day you'll catch them and like, well, who were you sitting with yesterday if you weren't sitting with me? <laughs> There's always time for hello and how are you, especially if you know the passengers. But on some runs, you have five to seven minutes. So yeah, you have time to exchange more than just courtesies. And lots of times, you have to take the time to explain. Just someone gets on, they need some information regarding where to go, how to get there. 2.43, we'll have 10 minutes. A 10 minute turnaround, okay? I grew up on a farm, um, one of seven. Always had jobs, as far back as I can remember. Always worked outside. Uh, always worked through college. Uh, life saving, teaching swimming. So it was always a physical activity, and it was always something outdoors, and it always involved people, or animals, but that was when I was much younger. Needham Junction. I love my job, I really do. I've told so many family members and friends, even passengers on the train, they're asking me all the time, do you like your job? And it always comes out, I love my job. Because I remember other jobs. Monday mornings, I'd be depressed. Come Sunday afternoon, I didn't want to get up. I'd be watching the clock all day. Next stop will be Needham Center. My uncle was a conductor on the railroad. And I came out of high school and came on a job and started as a fireman. So I have 23 years of service. The equipment itself is user friendly. It's all based on a computer system. These handles are pretty much almost the same way as our current equipment is. Uh, speed wise, we're operating right now at 135. With a hopefulness of 150 in the future, that's what we're looking for, is 150 miles an hour. Do not adjust your set. You have just jumped into the future. Amtrak engineer Dan Clayton is not sitting in a cyber photon game room. He's at the controls of the German Intercity Express, acronymed the ICE train, not to be confused with ICE-T. This high-speed commuter rail, one of the toasts of Europe, showed off its high-tech and high-tone style a year ago as it made test runs in the United States. We got on board as it traveled the Washington, New York Metroliner route. It was here because Amtrak was shopping around, comparing the ICE train to the X2000, the Swedish tilt train. Amtrak, despite its cuts, you see, is about to design and build its own high-speed train. 
They hope to have it on the Washington-Boston corridor by the end of 1997. And when they do, the airline shuttles will finally have competition. The trip between South Station and New York's Penn Station should take about three hours. I uh, worked a uh, Swedish train for about three months. Uh, I enjoyed working that. I enjoyed working this train, it's a beautiful train. We're uh, experimenting and having a lot of fun doing it, seeing a lot of new equipment. And uh, really enjoy uh, working the new equipment. 28 years of railroading, I never thought I'd see anything like this. We save so, a lot, so much energy with this train. We uh, produce no pollution, so uh, it is always possible for you with more and more trains from this that you can hold your nice countryside, a nice landscape. So we hope that you uh, decided to buy uh, equipment like this, this technology, and it is the best you can do for yourself. Electrification of the track between Boston and New Haven is scheduled to begin next month. So goes diesel pollution. This is in keeping with the Clean Air Act, which threatens to take away highway funds if a state doesn't take away air poisons. Riding a high-speed electrified train will help Massachusetts comply with the Clean Air Act. You'll be reducing hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen oxide. And you'll be saving four and a half million gallons of gasoline and 20 million gallons of jet fuel each year. And while you're doing all that, you can eat in style. The food and the service on the ice train were first rate, and so were the amenities. The train was equipped with a business traveler in mind. There were telephones in every car, fax machines, private conference rooms, and yes, there were even television screens to keep you on top of the news or to remind you of the world you left behind. There's something about a train that's magic, all right. I hope they make something like this one reappear real soon. You aren't inaugurating a permanent new service to Portland, are you? Well, no. I, I wish hope that... I look for that day. I'm, I do. A lot of people do, but for now, they'll have to keep on looking. Amtrak had given the green light to a Boston-Portland run, but with that last round of cuts, everything's on hold. Last fall, however, the Talgo, Spain's high-speed train, left North Station for a demonstration voyage of the proposed 120-mile rail link to Maine. On board was Wayne Davis of Train Riders Northeast, a citizens group that spent the past five years pushing for the Boston-Portland run. The fact that trains don't occupy a more important role uh, in, in transportation uh, in the nation, I think, is a direct result of, of government policies, deliberate policies that were, uh, were forced on them by big business. Uh, there was much more money uh, in rubber tires and internal combustion engines and oil and gasoline and so forth. And they were all conscious decisions uh, made by people who uh, were greedy, plain and simple. You don't have to be a Philadelphia lawyer to understand when you look at the figures that this mode of transportation uses an eighth of the fuel. It's the least polluting. There are many people in Boston who feel as Davis does. They too have banded together in a citizens group, a task force, and they are pushing a shorter but costly rail link, one to connect north and south stations under the new artery. This is an idea that goes back to 1909, and now when we're digging up Boston to build the uh, harbor tunnel and the depression of the central artery, it's obvious that now is the time to finally do it. What this does is has tremendous economic and environmental and transportation benefits for New England. It complies with the new congressional intent to have intermodal transportation, which is very important. Every single commuter rail station would have a direct connection with every single subway line, with every other commuter rail station. There would be direct connections to the airport and to the bus system. And uh, we feel that this would, this would create a situation in which there is a very substantial benefit to taking the train. Bellows, a Cambridge architect, has even designed the new stations for this proposed link. One under South Station, one under North Station, and one in the middle, Central Station, under the present aquarium stop. We are in worldwide competition. It's no longer an easy thing to imagine that companies are going to make decisions to locate here because they like the fact that we have the Museum of Fine Arts or the Boston Symphony. When they come to make decisions about where to locate, they look at the cost of doing business for their employees. And the better the rail system you have so that they can get their employees to work, the better off it's going to be, the more competitive we're going to be the lower the costs are going to be to compete worldwide. 
That's the name of the game. Currently, the Weld Administration is prepared only to pave the way and send those slurry walls down deep enough so that someday there may be rails beneath the underground artery. We believe that, that investing the extra $100 million that it's going to cost to extend the walls downward to create the missing link that, that uh, has been there in terms of rail travel makes a tremendous amount of sense because as we go forward, um, more responsible, environmentally sensitive uh, uh, modes of transportation are, are things that we're going to have to invest in. And we're not going to build a second major airport. High-speed rail is going to be a big part of uh, our future in terms of this country's uh, economic investment. So I think it's, it's not a project we're ready to go start uh, breaking ground on tomorrow, but it is a vision of transportation which this administration has, which I think has great value and which we're going to pursue very vigorously. The last time those stations were linked was 57 years ago when the shuttle crossed the old elevated railway many times a day. To bring that day back and below ground is going to cost a lot more than it once did. Estimates exceed $2 billion, and we'd be asking the same federal government for funds for a second project in the same corridor. Trying to put it under the artery makes the link extremely low. Uh, it'll make it much more complicated to construct, and I think that that's a mistake. I was deeply involved in the debate and in the effort to get this money out of the Senate, and I can tell you that our colleagues are not going to look very favorably on additional billions of dollars for Boston for what is already the most expensive per mile piece of highway in America. If you think about it, if we get the rail link, that means over here in Dewey Square you'd have the transit way, the red line, the depressed central artery, and the train. That's not a sandwich. That's an intermodal layer cake. Well, we may be waiting here for the train, but they're not waiting much longer on the South Shore. The old colony line is coming back. There will be three routes branching from the main line, which comes out of South Station and heads south toward Braintree. Before it gets there, the Greenbush line forks off and follows a shore route through Hingham, Cohasset, and Situate. This line, for the moment, is on hold. They're working on the other two lines, the ones that fork out of Braintree, one line to Plymouth, one to Middleborough. We've allocated, I think, about 70 or $80 million at this point in highway funds for the old Colony Rail project, and uh, that project is, is moving right along. As a matter of fact, that project was one of the uh, uh, mitigation measures that the state uh, agreed to uh, to do uh, a few years ago as as part of the part of uh, their green light to go ahead with the artery project. It first got the green light in 1845 and endured as a very popular Boston to Plymouth run right into the 20th century. As the car became very popular, however, ridership dropped. The New Haven Railroad, owner of the old colony, responded by reducing the number of trains and hiking the fares. In 1959, the state opted not to renew a $900,000 subsidy. And so, on June 30th, the New Haven shut down the 114-year-old Old Colony. That same year, the state officially opened the Central Artery and the Southeast Expressway. Soon after, the state bought the Old Colony tracks and right-of-way. It's ironic that with the opening of the Southeast Expressway, within weeks, ridership fell to such a such dire lows that they shut down the railroad and the irony is that the southeast expressway and it's so clogged right now with traffic is one of the major reasons why we have to re-establish uh, rail traffic did you ever notice we keep reinventing our wheels the mbta's john powers and bob egan have right now their job is to get those wheels up on the old colony tracks after they put down new tracks and do renovations in braintree and dorchester at Pearl Street, we have a grade separation going on because both of the lines meet at that one spot, and uh, we felt that there would be too much traffic and uh, pedestrian disruption if we didn't separate the track from the uh, roadway. So that road will be lowered 14 feet, and the track will be raised 9 feet at Pearl Street so that once it's all done, all of the trains will go in a bridge over the uh, traffic. Right now, there presently exists a gap in the right-of-way, on the mainline right-of-way, between the Quincy Shore and the Boston Shore. The, there was a bridge there and that burnt down in 1959. We are putting up a, a new bridge uh, for the old colony tracks. It'll be located just west of the Anderson Bridge, which is the Red Line Bridge that carries the Red Line trains over the Neponsa River. The whole effort to restore 
uh, the old colony is $480 million, excluding uh, Greenbush. We are expecting uh, full revenue service on the Plymouth, the uh, Middle Borough, and the Main Line uh, on December in 1996. When you include Greenbush, you include some trouble. Some residents on this route think the train will be a blight and a safety hazard. Folks in Hingham would like to see their downtown station underground. That could add more than $80 million to the project. When the whole old colony is completed, there will be 21 new stations. The MBTA hopes all three lines will attract a daily ridership of more than 20,000. If they ever get out of their cars. In the final analysis, there's no proof that shows if you give people alternatives like trains, subways, and buses, they actually take them in great numbers. We're fixated on driving. Too bad we can't bring back walking. That's a sure way to clean up the environment. Look at this promenade. That's Back Bay before they blasted Starro Drive through it. Back in the days when a lot more folks unwound by boating on the Charles. If Boston really wants to be intermodal, how about more boats like the Hingham Ferry? We're talking about the rest of the decade and then some before we see all these alternatives and the completion of the big dig. Until then, I think clever folks like Duck Tours have the right idea of how to navigate your way around Boston, its intermodal debates, and its ironies.